Good evening. Welcome as we gather in the house of our Lord to worship Him. This weekend we are observing Proper 24. The readings that we have from God's Word this weekend remind us how God has established government over us for our good to maintain uh, peace, law, and order in our society. God's Word also reminds us that in some cases He enables His own people to serve in worldly government positions also for our good. And so the theme that we will look at this evening is the Lord blesses submitting to the government. The order of service that we're following this evening is an adaptive form of the service of word and sacrament. You will see the service up on the screens for you. Uh, We have also uh, prepared bulletins for you tonight. I'll talk about them at the end of the service. Let us begin. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Oh, 
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. A lesson from the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 1, reading verses 3 through 21. The king told Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring some young Israelite men from the royal family or from the nobility. He was to choose young men who had no blemish, who were good-looking, who had insight into all kinds of wisdom, who possessed knowledge, understanding, and learning, and who were capable of serving in the king's palace, in order to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them daily rations from the special royal food and from the king's own wine. He ordered that they should be trained for three years. At the end of training, they were to serve the king. In this group of young men were the Judeans Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief of the officials gave them new names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah the name Shadrach, Mishael the name Meshach, and Azariah the name Abednego. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the special food of the king or with the wine that he drank. So he sought permission from the king, uh, the chief official so that he would not have to defile himself. God made the chief of the officials favorable and sympathetic toward Daniel. Then the chief of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. Why should he see your faces look less healthy than those of the other men who are of your age? You put my life at risk before the king. Daniel said to the superintendent, whom the chief of the officials had placed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your servants for ten days. Tell them to give us only vegetables, and we will eat them and drink water. Observe our appearance and the appearance of the young men who eat the special royal food. Then deal with your servants based on what you see. So he listened to what they said about this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, their appearance was noticeably better than that of the others. They were healthier than any of the young men who had been eating the special royal food. So the superintendent permanently took away the special royal food and the wine they were to drink and gave them only vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and insight into all kinds of literature, as well as wisdom. In addition, Daniel also understood every kind of vision and dream. At the end of the time, which the king had set for them to be brought to him, the chief of the officials brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king spoke with them, And none of the others were found to be comparable to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they served the king. 
In every matter concerning wisdom and understanding that the king sought from them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and spellcasters in his entire kingdom. So Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. You have been brought into fullness in him. Christ is the head over every ruler and authority. Alleluia. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted together how to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in accord with the truth. You are not concerned about gaining anyone's approval because you are not swayed by appearances. So tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil purpose and said, Why are you testing me, hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. They brought him a denarius. He asked them, Whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's, they replied to him. Then he said to them, Therefore give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. Then they left him and went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we now sing three stanzas of the hymn of the day. All depends on our possessing. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that indeed is what we are. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this weekend is is St. Paul's holy epistle to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. 
For no authority exists except by God, and the authorities that do exist have been established by God. Therefore, the one who rebels against the authority is opposing God's institution, and those who oppose will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to evil. Would you like to have no fear of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will receive praise from him, because he is God's servant for your benefit. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because he does not carry the sword without reason. He is God's servant, a punisher to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes, because the authorities are God's ministers who are employed to do this very thing. Pay what you owe to all of them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. The word of the Lord. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. No doubt you know what's coming up in a couple of weeks. You've seen and heard all the ads on TV and radio. You've seen all the signs planted in people's yards. You know there's another election right around the corner. This has made you stop and think about how you feel our elected leaders have done in governing our country. Perhaps you feel they've done a good job, or maybe you feel it's time for new leaders to take over. But when you hear Paul's words from Romans, everyone must submit to the governing authorities, how do they make you feel? Well, the sinful nature gets riled up when it hears that, and maybe it fills you with indignation. Maybe it causes you to say, Paul, you're nuts! Do you know what kind of times we're living in? It seems like every one of our leaders are in it for themselves. They don't care about what we want. They only care about their own prestige, their own honor. Plus, don't you know, Paul, that a number of our our leaders seem questionable in terms of their character? They make shady deals and sneaky laws just to suit their own agendas. And you're telling us we must submit to them? Paul, are you crazy? It's not my place, nor is it Pastor Shaywee's, to stand up here and promote political agendas. That's not what you've called us to do. You've called us to preach and teach God's word to you. And so, as another election day draws near, today's epistle reading is very appropriate for us to consider. This reading reminds us of the duty we owe to every leader in authority. We owe it to our local city leaders. We owe it to Governor Whitmer and our state legislators. We owe it to our representatives in Congress. And we owe it to President Trump. Our Father, through Paul, reminds us that everyone, Christians and unbelievers alike, has the duty to obey our leaders over us. But maybe this makes you think, Why should I obey our leaders? They're a bunch of greedy crooks who can't manage the country well. Paul gives the reason why. For no authority exists except by God, and the authorities that do exist have been established by God. As the creator of all things, God instituted government as one of the many blessings he gives us. Now maybe that makes you think, so does this mean... God has instituted all authorities, even the bad ones? Yes. Everyone who's in a position of authority has received that authority from God. And yes, that does include rulers and leaders of bad personal character and integrity. Some notable examples of the latter group would include Pharaoh of the Exodus, 
King Herod at the time of Jesus' birth, and Nero, the Roman emperor, when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. No matter if a leader is good or bad in terms of his character, he has still received his authority to govern from God. And, and, in, and indeed, God has given, has given us that command to obey those in authority over us. And doing so, to obey and respect our leaders, would be respecting God's good gift of government then. But on the flip side, the one who rebels against the authority is opposing God's institution, and those who oppose will bring judgment on themselves. No matter whether or not we agree with our leaders as far as their political stance is concerned, or whether or not we think their character is questionable, we must obey them because God has decreed it. To disobey them simply because we don't like them would be wrong. And that could lead to us receiving judgment or punishment from those same leaders. Now, maybe you've worried uh, whether or not our leaders will judge us any way they want. But God has a standard for them, too. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to evil. Leaders aren't meant to abuse their authority to judge people any way they want. But God has tasked them with judging each individual person by the good or the bad that they do. And so if you're afraid of our leaders, then Paul has some encouragement for you. Do what is good and you will receive praise from him because he is God's servant for your benefit. Leaders do genuinely appreciate when their constituents do good and avoid what is evil. So therefore, Paul is encouraging us to always do good because that won't anger our leaders. Whereas if we do evil, be afraid because he does not carry the sword without reason. When people do evil, the government isn't a toothless animal. God has given it the right to carry out punishment and to execute that, po that punishment in proportion to the evil being committed. Paul emphasizes this function of the government because it emphasizes one reason why we should obey the government, so that we don't anger our leaders and receive punishment from them. But Paul also tells us we should obey the government because of conscience. Our God has given us a conscience that reminds us of what is right and what is wrong. Our conscience tells us it is proper and right to obey the government, since indeed God has established government for our good. Now maybe you're thinking, I still don't want to respect and obey our leaders. They don't care about our needs. They only care about their power and their prestige. Plus, a lot of them are still questionable, questionable in terms of their personal character, so they don't deserve my respect at all. As I mentioned earlier, Paul wrote the letter to the Romans while Nero was the emperor. If there's anything to know about Nero, it's that it was under his watch that Rome burned to the ground. But did you know that Nero blamed the burning of, of Rome on Christians? Thus, Nero passed and allowed for government-sanctioned persecution of Christians throughout the empire. Given this circumstance, it would not surprise us if Paul had written, don't obey those leaders who are cruel and subject you to harsh laws. But instead, he tells us to submit to our leaders because they're in their positions of authority by God alone. And it is our duty to obey them. Indeed, to disobey our rulers just because we don't like them is wrong because we would be disobeying God's will for us to submit to the government. So how well do you follow 
God's will in obeying our leaders? Do you consistently respect and obey our leaders? Or do you consistently disrespect them through harsh words and opinions? Now you might say, well, our opinions are protected by the freedom of speech. Now don't get me wrong, that is a wonderful blessing we have here in the country. And it it is a guaranteed right for us. But we shouldn't want to abuse that by constantly disrespecting our leaders through harsh words and actions. We wouldn't want to abuse that because even though we may not like the way our leaders govern us or whether or not we feel they are a bad personal character, we can't forget that God has established them in their positions of authority. And he wants us to obey them. And so indeed to disobey those leaders would be wrong indeed. Rather, to obey is God-pleasing. And by showing respect and obedience to our leaders then, we would have the opportunity then, as Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, that others will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. But our sinful nature doesn't care about what Jesus says. It would want us to treat our leaders however we want. It goads us daily into disrespecting our leaders because it convinces us that that'll make us feel good. But when we disobey and disrespect our leaders simply because we don't like them, we're not just disrespecting them. We're also disrespecting and disobeying God who has given them that authority. And so to disrespect our, to disobey our leaders would indeed be sinful. And it is something that's very much worthy of God's anger and punishment. So where does that leave us? We know we ought to obey and respect those leaders God has placed over us. Our conscience reminds us of that daily. But our sinful nature continues to manipulate our personal feelings on our, uh, about our leaders in order to get us to disrespect and disobey them all the time. Our conscience and our sinful nature constantly play tug of war over us. And we are firmly gripped between the two sides as they try to get us to go over to it rather than to the other. And this struggle does grip us each and every day. And it will always have a hold of us as long as we're on this earth. And as we think about our failures to respect and obey our leaders, perhaps we feel guilty because we know we have disrespected and disappointed our Father. But here's something truly amazing. When our Father sees us, He doesn't see our failures. Instead, when He sees us, He sees us as perfectly obeying our leaders and respecting their authority. Uh, This truth that our Father sees us as perfectly obeying our leaders, maybe that confuses us. Because we know of our sinful feelings regarding regarding our leaders we know we don't always respect how is it then that god sees our obedience of our leaders as perfect but then we remember what the scriptures tell us we remember that the scriptures tell us our father sees us as perfect because we've been clothed in the perfect righteousness of our lord jesus christ whereas you and i fail on a daily basis to honor, obey, and respect our leaders, Jesus never failed to do those things. He always showed perfect obedience to his leaders. And he recognized that in our gospel reading for today. He told those disciples of the Pharisees that it's right and proper to honor and respect our leaders by doing things such as paying taxes. 
Jesus even demonstrated this perfect obedience in Matthew chapter 17, where he has Peter pay the temple tax for the both of them. But Jesus showed the ultimate respect and obedience to government when he was on trial before the Sanhedrin and Pilate. If there was ever any time when Jesus, God in the flesh, could have refused to submit to the government, it was when he was on trial, when he was falsely charged with blasphemy by his enemies. But Jesus didn't do that. Instead, as the prophet Isaiah declares, he did not open his mouth. Jesus didn't object when his enemies condemned him and when Pilate okayed his crucifixion. But he willingly submitted to it because he knew his perfect obedience to government would be credited to you and me. He knew that his death would cancel out all our failures to respect and obey our leaders. And so Jesus submitted all out of love for us. That's how the Father sees us as perfectly obeying our leaders. For Jesus' perfect righteousness covers over our failures. Indeed, we stand forgiven, redeemed, and loved by the Father now. So how do we respond then to this wonderful gift of Jesus' righteousness? We respond by respecting our leaders and obeying their authority. Sure, we, we may still not like their personal character, and we may not like the way they govern, or we don't like their stance on the issues. But we still respect and obey them as our way of thanking Jesus for perfectly obeying government in our place. This leads us then to follow Paul's words in verse 7. Pay taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, Respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. While our sinful nature still tempts us to disobey our leaders, our new self wants to obey our leaders. For our new self recognizes that the authorities are God's ministers who are employed to do this very thing. Since God has raised up our leaders for our good, and since his will that we obey our leaders still stands, we then want to indeed carry that out, to obey our leaders, even when it seems that they don't show good moral integrity or they abuse their authority for personal gain. We still submit to them because God has still given them their authority. Now, I should mention that there is one exception to where we don't obey our leaders. If our leaders use their authority to make us do something that goes against God's word, then we must follow what Peter says in Acts chapter 5. We must obey God rather than men. God does give us blessed government as a wonderful blessing. But if our leaders should tell us to go against God's word on something, then our ultimate allegiance is to God and his truth. That's the one time where it's okay that we don't obey our leaders. But if they don't tell us to go against God's word in anything, then we will happily respect their authority and obey them, all as part of our loving thanksgiving to Jesus. You probably know what you're going to do with this upcoming election. If you feel our current leaders have done a good job and you want them to stay, then it's your choice to vote for them. But if you feel... Our current leaders have not gotten the job done and it's time for new leaders to take over because those new leaders might handle things better, then that's your choice to vote for the new leaders. But what's definitely not a choice is whether or not to obey our leaders. No matter who is in office, God has given them their authority and he commands us to obey them. Sure, we may indeed struggle with guilt because we know we haven't always obeyed and respected our leaders. But thankfully, there's the cure for that. In Jesus' perfect obedience to government, something he freely gives us along with his forgiveness out of his great love for us. Since our God has been so good to us, how should we respond, particularly with reference to the government? Let's honor God with our lives, my brothers and sisters. 
in light of what Jesus has done for us, and in light of Paul's words in Romans 13, let's honor God. Let's honor God by obeying his representatives. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us now join together in confessing our Christian faith. We do so with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us sent for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. We include in our prayers this evening a prayer of thanks along with Louis and Margaret Kolb who celebrated their 71st wedding anniversary this past Monday, October 12th. And we will also pray for those who come to the Lord's table this evening. Let us pray. O Lord of heaven and earth, in your mercy, you have made us citizens of this nation in which we enjoy our cherished freedoms and rights. For the sake of your Son, our Savior, forgive us for those times we looked upon these freedoms and rights only as an excuse to carry out our selfish ambitions or sinful pleasures. Instill in us the gratitude of knowing especially that we have the freedom and right in this nation to worship you as you have revealed yourself to us in your word, the one true God, who is our creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Cause our faith in you to express itself, not only in private worship, but in daily godly living, in words and actions, that serve as guiding lights leading others to glorify you. As supreme ruler, you have established all governing authorities to maintain peace, law, and order in our society as a blessing for your people. Enable our leaders to govern with wisdom, honesty, courage, and justice. Protect those who serve in the armed forces and those who maintain peace and safety in our communities. Encourage and bless those of us whom you have enabled to serve in government positions, to do so faithfully. Help all of us to give respect and support to our government, not out of fear of punishment, but because it is your will that we honor those you have placed over us for our good in society. Heavenly Father, you have established marriage for our good we join Louis and Margaret Kolb in thanking you for all the blessings throughout the 71 years of their married life. 
by your grace they have enjoyed loving companionship with each other, raised their son in the training and instruction of the Lord, and learned forgiveness and unconditional love from you. Keep them committed to each other and to you. Continue to supply their earthly needs according to your will. Give them joy in the remaining years you give them together. Lord Jesus, grant true repentance to all who come to your table tonight. Perfect their faith and unite them in a living hope that they may abound in works of love and joyfully confess you as Lord to all people. For our nation and our government, we give you our thanks and make these requests. We pray in Jesus' name, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. You have established government for our benefit, and you direct us to honor, serve, and obey it with love and respect. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and host of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. 
May the strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Please stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated. We close by singing three stanzas of the hymn, To You, Our God, We Fly. Once again, good evening to all of you. We have a few announcements. I'm going to say some, then I'm going to see if you have a some, and then I want the last one. Okay? Okay. All right. So, first of all, I'd like to point out that next Sunday, following the 1030 service, uh, we will have our quarterly voters meeting. Voters, please keep that in mind. We'll probably start somewhere around 1130. Uh, You will notice in the bulletin that uh, we have a scripts program in connection with our school to raise funds for our school. 
Um, more information will be coming about that for all of our members, but please uh, keep that in mind. Um, we also have an announcement about uh, items that are needed for the Pregnancy Counseling Center. You will see those items on the back page of the bulletin. Uh, please, uh, we ask that you help out our organization by providing these items. Uh, you can bring them either to the church or give them to Gail McFarland. And also please note that Mount Olive will be hosting a blood drive on October 31st. Halloween. Sucking blood out of you. Hmm, kind of appropriate. Uh, you have the information in the bulletin on how you can make an appointment to give blood. Uh, those three announcements um, we will put on the church website as well uh, so that those of you who are watching at home uh, can know how to... Um, uh, or what items you can give to the Pregnancy and Counseling Center as well as, as making an appointment to give blood. So please check the church website. Okay, now you. I just have a couple that are showing up on the PowerPoint screen there. Just a reminder that this coming Monday is picture day at our school. So, Megan, all you school kids at home watching this online and our teachers, remember to bring your smiles on Monday. Also on Wednesday, a little bit of a busy day, we continue our look at the book of Joshua in our Wednesday Bible study, so please join us for either, at either 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. as we continue our look. And Evangelism Committee, remember we meet at 1.30, new time, 1.30, this Wednesday afternoon as well. That's all I have. You get the very last one. Yes, thank you. Um, we have resumed using bulletins again. Please understand this. This is now your possession. You take the bulletin home with you. Okay? Uh, we have made plenty of bulletins for everybody so that no sharing needs to be done. You don't have to leave it behind for any reason. Take it home with you. That's part of the safety uh, requirements that we are following. Thank you. And have a good week. Arrivederci.